أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميمين المظلومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My beloved brothers and sisters, respected viewers, welcome to a brand new show on Imam Hussein TV called T3. Teach, talk, and thrive. Inshallah, I'll be your host during the holy month of Ramadan. My name is Ali Burji. Uh, the aim of this show is to help us develop on social aspects through the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and to do that uh, we brought uh, a brother Sayyid Shabir Karmani from the United States of America Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum wa salam wa it's an honor to be here uh, it's an honor having you with us thank you so much for flying uh, from uh, the United States and uh, being with us during this holy month um, how's the fasting for you in London? To be honest, it's a, it's a tad long, longer than I'm used to, but it's phenomenal. It's in the sense that um, the community here is vibrant, bustling, thriving community. Um, I love that about London. It's very nice. I've, the people have been extremely hospitable towards me been wonderful in that regard. So I really loved my trip thus far. It's been very quite nice. Allah, that's good. And inshallah, I hope uh, you enjoy the en entirety of the stay. Um, now, uh, if... Uh, would like to ask you just to get a bit of your background, sure. where you come from, well, what have you been doing, where you involved, what activities mm. are you uh, interested in? Sure, like to be honest, I'm a, I'm a working professional, uh, that's my full-time uh, job. Uh, I've worked in technology, software, um, so in undergrad I studied uh, economics, math and computer science. Uh, and then after that I got into the working force after undergrad. And after that, I, I did my master's while actually working full time as well. And so I did that in engineering as well. And uh, now I'm currently working on my PhD. So I've always had this vision that, you know, Islam and secular success, they're not mutually exclusive. They're actually part and parcel of the same thing. And you can have the best of both worlds. And I think that's what it, it lays that foundation towards it. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, young guys I grew up with, uh, and I think a lot of uh, people in general, uh, felt, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, do I have to pick and choose my path? Do I have to be like religious or, or can I be secular or can I, can I actually thrive in both? And hopefully through this show and through this discussion, we can actually get to a point where we, we see how we can actually thrive, both as individuals and as communities at large. And Islam actually gives us the tools to be able to do that at a very high level. So that's really how my background came about. And that's how actually I got into lecturing, to be honest with you. It was, it was, it was a need. A lot of young people were, were feeling as though, you know, um, there aren't people who can really relate speaking to them. And so one of the communities I was at early on was like, you know, they were saying that, you know, we need somebody, but we're, we're not able, we don't have the resources to make that happen for someone to, to speak, uh, especially, for example, in the English language, you know. And uh, second of all, relating to uh, the younger demographic, the youths, like issues like, uh, you know, music and you know a lot of the things that go on in, in, in school life you know in elementary middle high school college scene and so there's a, a big identity crisis that, that a lot of youth feel like you know like where am I where do I fit into this big picture what's my identity and so I sought to try to pursue and answer those questions for myself and through that process I wanted to help answer that question for others as well well I'm looking it's very forward blessing. to extract that information from yourselves um, prior to that well, the topic for today is activism and development during mm. the holy month of Ramadan. Mm. And uh, also would like to inform our respected viewers that uh, inshallah, at the second half of uh, the program, we'll be accepting calls for a Q&A with the Sayyid. And the telephone number will be visible at the uh, bottom of your screens, inshallah. Now, before we go into our topic. I wanted to ask you, since you've come from abroad, from America, mm. we are aware that both the uh, United States and the United Kingdom, alhamdulillah, mm. there is a very strong Shia community. Mm. What are the difference, if any, mm. between the Shia communities in America and in the United Kingdom, what you've seen so far? Mm. Uh, benefits, positives? 
Absolutely. So there are distinctions. There's a lot of similarities, as you alluded to and you highlighted, right? Um, al alhamdulillah, on that front. And but there are some differences, especially I've been mostly in the London and its vicinity. Um, the, the 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 brothers and sisters in the community in London, alhamdulillah, they're very close. Like in the sense that um, you know, London is a very compact city. It's a city that has a lot going on in a little bit of space. In the United States, the Shia community is mostly it's dispersed because the landscape of the United States is so vast. So you have pockets in big cities, for example, New York, New Jersey, and places like that. You have uh, the Californias, Los Angeles, locations like that, Dearborn, Detroit. These areas have bustling, thriving communities as well. But now we're seeing a lot of pockets of Shia communities emerging throughout the country. And this includes places like, for example, Utah or Kansas City, Missouri, and other places where traditionally you may not have heard of these communities. And they also have, alhamdulillah, thriving communities. But alhamdulillah, what I noticed in London, which was really beautiful to me, was that in this metropolitan city, one of the leading global cities in the world, you have a bustling, thriving community, both in numbers and also in, in active activism. And there's something that I think we can share across the Atlantic. We can actually kind of learn from each other and see what's working and actually help develop a stronger community. But I was blown away by the hospitality and the love of the community. Alhamdulillah. Uh, since you've mentioned it with regards to um, sharing information and experiences, mm. how important is it to have a unity mm. amongst the communities, especially Shia communities? Brother Ali, this word that you use is phenomenally important. Unity. I think this may be arguably the most important thing for us as followers of the Ahlul Bayt Salam. In particular, first in our own home, in our own house, as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, we must stay united at all times and at all costs. And our scholars have been very adamant about this in particular. Um, and if we don't, do we risk a lot of challenges further down the road. And uh, so that would be a very important thing. I would say that my message in London, and, and my message in the United States has been the same, that we must be very united. Now, under what, which banner? Under which banner do we become united? This is a very important discussion because a lot of people use the term unity. What does unity really mean? Has anyone really defined what unity means? I think that's an important discussion we need to have. Does unity mean, for example, that we take, let's take the example of Muslims, for example, in general. Does that mean that I come forward and say that, you know, all people, who we, we, we take all of those things that Muslims have, we take all the commonalities, and we remove all the differences. And we, may, we, may, we make one new sect, or one new thing. So focusing on the common grounds and build common grounds. their own. So that's one option. Another option is the dominant or the majority faction or, or sect within Muslims, they take the mantle, and everyone else must adopt to them. For example, today in today's modern world, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah may be the dominant number in terms of sheer numbers. And all other Muslims in different sects must come under that umbrella. For example, Shia within Shia Zaydi and other groups have come under that faction, or others within the Muslim realm, they all have to come under the umbrella of that, for example. Now, you can see with both of these situations, there can be problems or challenges. Because within the schools of thought, for example, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, there may be people who say, for example, you know, I adhere to one school of thought, Hanafi, or someone says Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, for example, with due respect to all of them. But who's going who's gonna to be the right one? Everyone will say, I have my view. So consensus on that front would be very difficult. On the other front, if we said, we let's look at all the commonalities and we discard all the differences and form, let's, for example, Shia and Sunni and form a new sect, let's call it Sushi, for example. Let's make that. Would people agree? No one would agree, because those differences, they exist for real reasons that are important to both sides and both parties. I would like to propose, perhaps, and other scholars have also proposed, another version of what a unity means. It means that I say that an individual's life, property, and dignity is sacred that I will not infringe on that person on that respect. I will not disrespect them. I will not say that spilling their blood is permissible, for example. I will not disrespect them. I will not steal from them. And that perhaps is the most viable definition of unity. Because unity does not mean compromising one's beliefs. 
And we should not have a problem with that. In, in particular with followers of Ahlul Bayt Salam, this is, I was talking about the general community, but in followers of Ahlul Bayt Salam, we must all unite under the single banner that we are followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib first and foremost. And we fall under his banner. If we agree to that, we can talk about anything, we can discuss anything. And unity should not be a problem for us, inshallah. Ah, Santum, well said, well said. Um, another thing <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about with regards to us developing communities mm. from different backgrounds and nationalities, mm. mashallah, Shia from Pakistan, mm. India, mm. Um, from M Middle East, Arabs, mm. or even um, converts, mm. reverts. The thing that uh, we have in common is the language. For example, United States mm. and uh, United Kingdom is English. Mm. And especially a second, third, fourth generation of uh, foreigners mm. have English as their first language. Mm. W w according to your opinion, how have we improved with regards to the, um, for example, lecturing? Mm. Uh, we've got, mashallah, lots of English-speaking lecturers nowadays. Mm. Has, has it improved dramatically? Is there room for, for improvement? Is there more to be done? Is it enough? Mm. Is it sufficient? Mm. With regards to the exposure that English-speaking, even though uh, a, a <coughs> lot may have parents who speak Urdu, Arabic, mm. and can um, either tune to a channel or attend majalis in their mm. native languages. But mm. for, uh, for us, for example, who were born and raised in America and may not yes. have Urdu or Arabic as our uh, first language, and it's English. Mm. Um, do we have enough material? Uh, is there enough uh, of uh, projects and uh, lecturing going on to suffice, is it? Mm. So a wonderful question you ask here. So I'll give you a little bit of my background. I was born and raised in DC, right? right? And I've lived my whole life in the West. Um, there was a portion of, of my life where we actually moved to Dubai in my youth, and then we came back to America. So from DC to Dubai, and from Dubai to back to America, and to Florida in particular. And I was able to see East and West there. Now, this language question that you're asking is actually a very important question. And sometimes people get afraid of the discussion. And I don't think there's any cause of fear. It's really a natural progression. If you look at the history, um, you'll find many, uh, for example, people who have, or, or Sadat, for example, Sayyids, who have their lineage uh, from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam And these people, for example, they live today all over the world. But if you go back a little bit historically, they lived in, for example, Hijaz on the western bank of Saudi Arabia initially. That's where the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam were. And then there was a movement towards Iraq, for example. But now as time progressed, you were began to see Sadat and Sayyids in, for example, Iran. You began to see them, for example, in, in, in Lebanon, Jabal Amal and places like this. You saw, began to see a migration from Iran and forward towards even Hind, India, Pakistan and these places as well. Well, how did that come about? When we talk about this notion of identity and developing a community, this is extremely important that we understand where Shiaism has come from and where is it going to so we can chart the path of where it is going through. You know, there was a time where the Muslims, the Shia in particular, followers of, Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, were persecuted to such an extent and the Sadat in particular, those Sayyids who claimed lineage from Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, you know, but the Ali, there was a time in the history of Baghdad, Tariq al Baghdad, that they would not erect a building until they would drain the blood of a Sayyid Hassani in the cement. This was the level of animosity that they had towards Ahl al Bayt. <laughs> and so when we begin to think, how did this migration happen? Well, it happened because they were being heavily persecuted, which exists till this day, as you see throughout the globe, in Iraq, for example, in Pakistan, and other places, in Afghanistan. But what happened was, they said that we must keep our mission alive, we must keep our Iman alive. And so they began to say that this place no longer is suitable for us. For example, at a time in Baghdad, that is not, no longer suitable. So they said we must migrate to places where we can save this religion and pass it forward. So for example, they moved from Iraq, they moved towards Iran for example, and this migration happened throughout. But what did these people take with them when they left? Did they take their property? Did they take all their wealth? Did they take all that? No. They took two things. They took their books of their scholars of Islam, of Shiaism, 
in their hands and they took their iman in their hearts and they migrated. And when they migrated, the value of iman was so valuable to these people that they were willing to forsake even their language at times. So those people who are first in Iraq or in the Arab belt or in Medina, modern day Medina, Al-Hijaz for example, they had Arabic. But as they migrated towards Ajam, from Arab to Ajam, they came to a point where they began to adopt the language. A language to perhaps we think, some people think for example, leaving your language of Urdu or Arabic or Farsi or for example any other language is difficult at this time. You know there was a time where the division was Arab and Ajam amongst the Arabs. Ajam meaning someone who's mute. This is how much pride the Arabs had in their language because it was a beautiful language. It was a specific language, it was a language of depth. It was probably very difficult for them to leave their language. By the way, I don't say that one should completely leave their language. And I'll come to that at some point if we have the opportunity. Because there is a blessing, and as our scholars have also alluded to. To keep, keep your identity. To, to keep your identity. Subhanallah, Santum, That there may be a very, very valuable reason for knowing your mother tongue as well. Because there may be certain words that exist in those languages that may not necessarily yet exist in your language. And so it's important to understand those. For example, what word? For example, a word like haya. Haya, we typically say modesty. Now, modesty is not a comprehensive definition. I need to include some other things. I need to include modesty, shyness, integrity, and mm. a series of other words to try to give a glimpse of what it means. That's the beauty of Arabic. It's the beauty of the language. Same with barakah. We say, alhamdulillah, there's tremendous barakah in Shahr Ramadan. And no doubt about it. Tremendous barakah. But how do I explain to somebody barakah just by saying it means blessings or abundance? Is that really the true meaning? And hence I think this is why the scholars perhaps, they said that there is certain things that are embedded in the culture that have come from the religion and they're inseparable. So there's a benefit there. But as those communities migrated from the Arab belt to Iran and then on to Hind and on to Afghanistan and Pakistan and throughout the globe from there, they began to adopt new languages. And this gave rise to beautiful things through the barakah of Imam al-Hussein For example, the beautiful majalis that were done throughout the world. That Arabic poetry that was so beautiful in Hijaz and Iraq and those belts. Then when that moved on to, for example, Iran, it took a new flavor. With that influence, an original influence, mm. it took on a new flavor. And then they added their own character to it. Ahsantum. It had, it so now you have them. both, for example, uh, Farsi poetry and you have the Arabic poetry. And both are beautiful and each one, each one of them has its own um, identity and distinguished uh, Subhanallah. Yeah. And it went, the same happened when it moved to, to Hind, pa India, Pakistan. It mm. took on a new flavor as well. And I'm proposing that the same will happen when it comes to English. It will learn from those traditions and build upon it. And this is why we need more poets, more speakers in the English language mm. to cause that evolution to occur. We don't have a Di'bal or a Farazdaq in English yet. Inshallah we will. And we need that. It's Inshallah. very important. And the same with speakers. But now coming to the notion of development. How, do this, how does this relate or tie to development? You notice as those communities migrated from the Arab Belt to Persia throughout they adopted those traits and those cultures. Are we in our migrations learning the best of each community? Alhamdulillah, I've had the opportunity to lecture throughout in various communities. I've lectured, alhamdulillah, Iranian community, Iraqi community, Lebanese community, Pakistani, Afghani, and all mixed as well. And alhamdulillah, you notice certain communities have certain strengths. And how do you learn from each of the other? This community, community A may have a strength that community B does not, and vice versa. Can we teach each other? Can we learn from each other and build upon that? That's what we should do. That's what we should do. That's what we should do. We awesome. help one another because by remaining united, uh, we could help, for example, if we have any defects, uh, another um, group of people may have a remedy for that mm. defect. Mm. And we could share the knowledge. Mm. And that's how we can improve. But if we isolate ourselves, Ahsan. we ain't doing no one a favor. Ahsan. 100% agree with you on that. It's a very important notion. I've met certain communities where, for example, they may be very good uh, artistically. 
Some communities produce very good poets who their imagination, they, uh, it leads them to recite some of the best poetry of Ahlul Bayt Amr. I've met other communities, for example, they're very good in business and enterprising and entrepreneurship. This is their strength. How can we merge those pieces of the puzzle to build on it to get to a point where we are the strongest community, where the rest of the world is looking and saying, look at how the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, how they have enterprised and how they have built systems and infrastructure for the rest of the world. Because this is what Ahlul Bayt Salam did. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Rasulullah Azam himself. These great personalities, they were, not, they were not just sitting about and they were not in, to the point where not, we're told in Islam, you're not to just sit at home and just pray or just sit in the masjid and just pray at all times. No, there's a balance. Rasulullah has told us very Allah. clearly Allah. to divide and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi mm-hmm. Divide your day, your awake day in thirds, in three parts. So Ya Rasulullah, how? He said, first in obtaining a halal rizq. Halal? Livelihood. Halal? Sustenance. A lawful sustenance. This is a part of deen. This is a part of, of one's belief, one's religion. He says, number two, make sure you take out some time for your friends and family. Your close friends and your close family, make time for them every day. It may not be as much as you want, but make sure it's there. And he said, a third, that third time is between you and your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in prayer. That's the, how you should divide one's day. I remember I was speaking in London in one of these, in one of the beautiful centers here. And I, I spoke that, and I, I mentioned this tradition. And uh, one of the sisters came to me afterwards, and she asked about that, and she said that, you know, I really needed to hear that. And I said, why? I, I'm always trying to listen. I believe speakers should listen more than they speak. It's very important. And so she said that, you know, I'm in a position in work where I'm working six, six and a half days a week for hours on end. 10, 12 hours days. And you revived my belief system in terms of understanding that, you know, this is something that's not separated. You know, today in the modern world, sometimes we compartmentalize our world. What does that mean? That means that when I'm at work, I'm in work mode. And when I'm, for example, at school, I'm in school mode. Mm. And then when I come to the mosque or the masjid or the Husseiniya, then I'm in Islamic mode. But outside yeah. of that, it's not Islamic. No, it's mode. funny, but now that you mention it, of me pondering over myself as well, mm. I do, I do do it, and, and um, unfortunately, it, it, it's become like a second nature. Mm. I can't help it. It makes mm. sense, but why? And how? How can I um, change it? How can I at least improve on it or use it? Mm. Can I use it to to a, a benefit, or mm. do I have to reshape it, reform it? Mm. It's a beautiful question. So. We're all kind of guilty of this duality, this dual life, you know, if you will. And the reality of the matter is, if we focus on our our goal, which is to be good followers of the Ahlul Bayt, our compass in life is always the same as followers of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. They'll always guide us to where we need to get to. Because we always need a reference point. We always need to understand where it is and what is reality, what is truth. Because tomorrow society may tell me that this, for example, song is really great, you should be listening to it. Or it may be saying that go to this, for example, place on a Friday or Saturday night and that's the best thing for you. How do I check and gauge, is this right or not? And this is not to judge anyone. You know, we're all on our own journey. We're all in our own degree of faith. You would hope that the chart of religiosity, of Islamic sciences, and that relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and al-bayt is always inclining, it's always going up. But for others, maybe it doesn't go all the way up, Some, sometimes it drops. But the hope is the trend always is trending up. You know, like a stock graph, a graph of the markets. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it goes down and sometimes it goes up. But the general trend you can track is over time it's going up. If At we least have that, that should be the aim. That should because be Because it the makes aim. sense. I always try to um, think of it, putting myself in my own shoes. Sometimes I feel that spiritual motivation mm. where mm. I want to focus more in my salah, mm. I want to extend my sujood, mm. I want to do extra amal, mm. mustahabbat. Mm. And other days, I just, it's, it's as, as if the fire may be not completely mm. there. Mm. And I may question myself, it's like, why? Mm. Why? Why? 
How, why was it like this a week ago and I'm different a week now? Is it what I eat? Is it how I live? Mm. Does this influence mm. my spirituality? And uh, with regards to especially now we're talking about Shah Ramadan and development and yes. we'd like to focus in how can we um, focus all this energy because Shah Ramadan is a beautiful, blissful month where a lot of people should embrace it as an escape route that mm. you can find a way to just detach yourself from dunya and just mm. focus that this month, yes, I still have to go to work and earn my living. Mm. But the main aim of this month is inshallah to increase my spirituality, gain more knowledge, but uh, build a better relation with the, the Holy Quran and Ahlul Bayt. Mm. You put it very beautifully. And I think that's the problem we have in our community. Whenever we see a problem, mm. it's because either we abandon the Holy Quran or the Ahlul Bayt in a certain mm. subject or topic. Mm. And that's how, the, the, when you said it, it's, it's just, it, that's the answer. Mm. If you keep the Holy Quran and the Ahlul Bayt as your compasses, there's no way you can go mm. straight. The Holy Prophet ﷺ said himself, Hadith of Thaqalayn. You could never go astray, but that maybe maybe the distractions of dunya mm. and the whispering of shaitan mm. mm. that we kind of lose that mm. aim of focus in life. And mm. Shah Ramadan is the best month mm. to regain it. Mm. And it, beautifully with this topic as well, I want you to uh, kind of slowly, slowly open it up as to advising with regards to activism and development mm. in the holy month of Ramadan. With regards to development, how can I help myself develop mm. so the next 11 months will be prosperous and beneficial? Not that I'm going to switch off after Eid al-Fitr. I don't want to do that. I want to build so the next holy month I'll have already gained some ground and mm. I'll aim to gain even more. How can I do that? Mm. Ahsan. So when we talk about activism and development, if you want to be an activist, and you want to be a change agent in your world or your sphere of influence or you want to develop a community or a society well how do we go about do that doing that well a society a movement for an activist a movement or for a someone who's interested in development developing a community developing a society they all begin with the same thing and that's the individual Communities are built with individuals. Movements are built with individuals. So what does that mean? Shahr Ramadan, this blessed month of barakah, as per Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He says in the Holy Book, and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam tell us in their various traditions, this is a month of abundant barakah, abundant grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and blessings. What does that mean for you and I? What does that mean for us? And it's also a particular opportunity for us to gain something through that barakah. Barakah meaning that the gates of mercy of Allah are open in this month. To the extent that we have been told that shaitan is locked up in this month. That anything that we do that is wrong or in vain is because of his training that he's make us, made us accustomed to and attuned to. So the question is at the end of the month, when he is freed or let loose, for example, how much work are we going to give him? Is it going to be as though he's going to say, for example, oh, this guy is just where he left off, or God forbid, worse? Or, for example, there may be a moment in time where that person begins to say that no, the shaitan himself is saying that I have to start from square one. Development is very important on that front. Developing, so discipline is the main route. As an individual, I must discipline myself if I hope to create a community or create a movement. Communities, strong, vibrant communities require these movements. They go hand in hand, part and parcel. So if I want to be an activist, I must engage in having self-control. And this is what this month of Ramadan brings to us. You know, I often think about what was Shahr Ramadan for Ahlul Bayt Ali Musa? And this is what we are going to get at, the crux of in this show. And this is what I hope to tackle. Inshallah, Um We'll continue. Uh, before that, we'd like to go to a short break. So please do stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, uh, my uh, beloved brothers and sisters, respected viewers. Uh, you are watching a brand new show called T3 on Imam Hussein TV. Teach, talk, and thrive, inshallah. Now, we've reached our second half of the show where we'll open the lines for any of you who would like to join the discussion uh, and ask any questions, or even if you would like to add to anything that's been said already. Uh, phone number will be visible on the uh, uh, bottom of your screens. It's 0203 515 I repeat, 0203 515 Inshallah, we'll be looking forward to your phone calls. Now, before proceeding to a topic, uh, there's something uh, Sayyid has uh, touched upon regarding um, shaitan during the holy month of Ramadan. And mm. that's just something I wanted you just to expand mm. a bit for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned about shaitan during this holy month uh, has been locked up. Mm. I want you to just elaborate on that for mm. us. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. What's the effect? What effect does it have on shaitan? Mm. Does that mean I can't sin? Does that mean I can't mm. get whispers? Mm. Bismillah. Ahsan, very good question. Now, and this ties back into what, what, what I was alluding to before the break, and that is that, that indeed the work of shaitan may have been done to an extent that during Shahr Ramadan it becomes very difficult for one to break down the work that has been done by shaitan. And so those waswas can continue, for example, in some level. In the sense that it's already ingrained in one's mind that I've been doing the ita'ah, I've been do listening to shaitan, I've been doing his obedience, God forbid. May Allah protect us. But the reality of the matter is, if that is what I've been trained to do and I've trained myself to do, then it becomes harder to break down those things. But I don't want anyone to lose hope because Shahra Ramadan is a tremendous beacon of hope that can, that can invigorate the hearts. And that's really what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to me I, is saying. That I have opened the floodgates of Rahmah in this month. That you have every opportunity available to you to make use of this blessed month. And this blessed month should not just be used and limited to just individual and I think about myself. It starts there, but it doesn't end there. I must use this fuel to build my community, my society, and my country, and the world. That's really where we need to get to. That's the level we need to be thinking at. So what kind of opportunities will we get during the holy month of Ramadan? Tremendous. So hard work is a necessary prerequisite. And a necessary prerequisite to that is discipline. Having self-control. Having the ability to control my own nafs which is a struggle we all go through, day in and day out. And each person's test and trial is different. For, for one individual, it may be for something, for another, it may be something completely different, and at different levels. So how do you go about managing that? It's a struggle, struggle. But Shahr al-Ramadan helps us on that, helps prepare us for that, to have control and discipline over ourselves. If we don't have that discipline, we won't go very far. I'll share with you briefly, Brother Ali, if you may. There's a very famous study. It's called the Stanford Marshmallow Study. I want the viewers to check that out if they're not aware of it. This is a study that was done a few decades ago. And what they did in this study, and I'm going to a, a conclusion here, what they did was they brought a, a few children into a, uh, into a lab. And it, was, it looked like it was just a room, essentially. And these were little children, and they said, listen, for the sake of the, this, we can make it a candy. I mean, we can make it, you know, a lollipop or something like that. It doesn't have to be a marshmallow. Whatever. Take your example. That's what they used. And they told the children, listen, we're going to put this candy here in front of you. And we're going to go outside for a few minutes. If we come back and that candy is still there, then you get an extra candy. You get two. I'd like to pause you on that. Mm. We've got a call on the line. Mm. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shahr Ramadan Mubarak. Likewise, you guys and everyone in the studio, wishing you all a very great Ramadan, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Likewise. Yes, brother, would you like to contribute or ask uh, the Sayyid a question? I had a question for the Sayyid. Um, basically, um, I have a lot of Sunni friends at work, and usually after Afar, they invite me down for Taraweeh at their center. But I'm usually a bit shy to tell them no, or I don't do this for that, or mm. so and so. Mm. What's the advice best for me to do in such situations? Is it haram for me to go, or 
should I just tell them I'm, I'm from a different sect of Islam or what do you think is best for me? Okay. In this situation, that's a very good question. Mm. Very good question, Ahsantum. And I'm pretty sure a lot of our brothers and sisters can relate to it. Ahsantum, thank yeah. you, brother. Mm -hmm. thank Jazakumullah you. Thank you please. Um, inshallah, Sayyidna. So, with regards to uh, this um, issue, Mas'ala, um, what do you think? Well, for, there's, a, there's a few things to, to, to discuss here on a few levels. Uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has laid a very, very clear principle for us. That people are either your brother or, or in faith, or they're your equals in humanity. And what that means is we have respect for everyone. Mm -hmm. Whether that's a, a Muslim or otherwise, no problem on that front. For example, and we all go through this. I, I came from work, uh, I was working yesterday, today as well. We have colleagues and friends uh, for within Islam, for example. I'm sure the same is true for you and all, for all of others. Indeed. And we, we, we say to them the same way, that for example, you, we don't have to go into necessarily all the historical aspects of Tarahui and its, its innovative nature, that it was not, it was not something that was mm. there. You know, and this is very, very uh, clear, you know, because there's a very, uh, it's well documented with respect to how long did Rasulullah, for example, do this? Did he do this for the whole 30 days? Or did he do it for three days at the end of the, according to the, the, the traditions of Ahl Sunnah al-Jama'ah, for example? Mm -hmm. And if on top of that, how many raka'ah did he recite? Does he, was he reciting 11 or 13? How many was he reciting? And so when you go to, for example, and I don't want to go too much into this, but when you go to, for example, Saudi Arabia, you find one way it is adopted and you go to other parts of the Muslim world, there's a different way in which Tarawiyah is done and things like this. There's not consensus. As in, did Rasulullah, how many times, how many raka'ah did he do? And for how many days? Some people say that he did th three days only. And some people say that, for example, he only did, for example, a few raka'ah. But then there's not consensus among the community in, in terms of why you do 30 days, for example. Or why you do a certain amount of rakah. But we don't want to get into this, for example, this is an innovation. And this is an Islamic historical debate. Okay. But the Ahlul Bayt السلام, have said and have alluded to us not to try to get into religious arguments too much. And the reason is because they had this hikmah and this wisdom that many times people become, they become, this is my group, this is your group, and they don't come to agree or they don't come to listen to the other party. They come to cause friction. And if that's going to, if you know that this conversation is going to go to a point of friction, then don't discuss. And even worse, if, if, we, if we lack the, the knowledge, mm. there's, it's best not to get into an argument whatsoever. Mm. Exactly. I mean, and furthermore, and, and this is true in America for sure, and I'm sure this is probably true at some level in Europe as well, that there's certain things you don't talk about at work. For example, you don't talk about religion, you don't talk about politics. You know, it's called distasteful, it's considered distasteful. Although these topics come up mm. all the time, you can't really escape them. Yeah. But to get into an in-depth discussion, there is a, you can say, if you want to have, and you know the situation, the dear respected brother who called in, knows the situation better than I do, or you do, or us. And if you think that this is, there is some space for hope to explain to the brothers what is the reality of the matter, then take that, inshallah. Subject to the uh, receiver being willing to accept Precisely. It. If you feel that that person was, it may not benefit and it may cause more strife, mm. then it may be best to say that, uh, my brother, I have my dear, res I have my respected view. I respect your view. I do not uh, partake in tarawih, but I, uh, I don't stop you from doing it, for mm. example. And you leave it at that. Now, if, if in the scenario where, let's say, for any reason, X, Y, Z, um, the person felt shy and did not want to reject the invitation. Mm. If I went, now we're going a bit into fit, but for the sake of argument and for the sake of knowledge, mm. if I attended um, the ceremony, is it haram for me to do it? Um, is it okay for me to join the salah? Can I just join and just do um, a niya intention of just praying to rak'ahs or whatever? Perhaps if you want to just go and listen to the recitation, because Alhamdulillah, credit where credit is, some of our brothers have beautiful recitation of the yes. Quran. Let's let's listen there. Alhamdulillah, you can listen to the recitation of the Quran. There, no problem. Okay. But in terms of, do I have the authority 
to impose on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger a new rule which was not there before, this would be, un uh, this would be unjust to the, to the rule. So this is why I say, for example, on that front, you know, a lot of, I have many friends in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, some of my dearest and closest friends, as my dear uh, respected caller may have as well. Many times I've noticed our friendship has remained a strong friendship because we have not gone in depth discussions on religion. It sounds kind of strange, right? But that's why. Because we start getting boxing each other into this group and we stop being open minded. This goes back to what is the definition of unity. The definition of unity does not necessarily mean that I bring you to my side of belief 100% or vice versa. You bring me to your side of belief 100%. No. Because if that was unity, no two people 100% agree on, on everything. Even a father and son, they may have two, three, five percent different difference of opinion. Two brothers, siblings, brother and sister, they may see 50-50 different views of the world. Or not at all. That's not the meaning. My brother is still my brother. My father is still my father. I have absolute respect, although there may be a difference of opinion. The same is what we should approach with, with brothers in Islam. That we, they have a difference of view. Mm. And the same with, for example, fasting. Our brothers in Ahl Sunnah, for example, they open their fast prior to uh, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt Ali Muslim. A slight delay, for example. What does the Quran uh, say, for example? You can get into these discussions, but is the person on the other receiving and open-minded to listen, for example? And vice versa. That's the issue. That the Quran, for example, it says that, that recite your salah in the evening, for example, and keep your, 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 your fasting to layl. The word night. So what's first, evening or night? So these are things that linguistically one can talk about. But only to open that door if you think the receiver is open to that. There are many people who just seek to argue for the sake of argument. I don't know what, what, what case this falls into. But we must be prudent on that when we have that discussion. How do you bring one closer to your viewpoint? The best and most optimal way is through akhlaq, through etiquette, through mannerism of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. This is how they themselves did it. And Shahr Ramadan is a beautiful time to develop that etiquette, that mannerism. You know, it reminds me of a story very quickly about Rasulullah. Bismillah. Where please. there was a man who he was in a state of fasting and he began to scold his, his maid. Wealthy man, he had a maid, and Rasulullah had to be in the happened to be in the proximity. It was Shah Ramadan. At that point in time, he began to shout and scream and scold at her. Rasulullah offered him some food, a date or something like this. He said, "Ya Rasulullah, Shah Ramadan, I'm fasting. You, you, you are Rasulullah Adam. You should know this." He said, "It doesn't seem like you're fasting <laughs> by your etiquette and your conduct." Meaning he gave a huge statement, Rasulullah Adam, there. Yeah. That it's not just, fasting is just not staying away from food and drink. Mm. Fasting is much bigger than this. Yes. He I said that it, your etiquette, this anger is not tolerable in, 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 in Siyam, in the fasting state. You must have control over yourself. And that's the thing. I think Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim were divine representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No doubt about it. But if you ask me what was most important to them, I don't think it was staying away from food and drink. Because mm -hmm. Ali ibn Abi Talib ate very little throughout the day and night. Inside or outside of Rafael Ramadan. He was eating a little bit of barley, a little bit of water. Very, very meager. He did not eat much. But the lesson he was trying to teach others was have control over your nafs. That includes your anger. That includes your desires. That includes everything. Inshallah, we can benefit from this month. Ahsantum, Ahsantum, Sayyidina, Jazakumullah Khair. Unfortunately, um, we've uh, come to the end of our program, but we will continue the same topic, activism and development during the holy month of Ramadan for tomorrow, same time, 6.30, Inshallah. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to wish you all, dear brothers and sisters and respected viewers, um, we're approaching slowly, slowly, um, to the time of uh, Maghrib and Iftar, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all in this holy month and uh, always, always never forget to remember uh, Imam Al Asr was the man, Ajallah ta'ala, Faraj al Sharif, in your prayers and uh, pray uh, for the hastening of his reappearance. And inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all.
uh, with uh, a lovely iftar, inshallah, on a daily basis. Uh, coming up next is, inshallah, Ahkam SOS with uh, Sheikh Ma'ash and Sayyid Muhsin Shah. So stay tuned. Thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank mm -hmm. you.